The United States declared itself independent of British rule in 1776. The process of growing and gathering strength to stand on its own as an independent nation had begun long before. In the year 1630, after the British King Charles I declared the Puritan religion to be illegal, John Winthrop, a wealthy London Puritan, left Britain with a large following of Puritans to populate the Massachusetts Bay Colony in North America. John Winthrop was elected as the colonial governor. He could see that unless the colony could establish an industrial base, they could never advance beyond supplying raw materials to British industries and would always have to purchase manufactured goods that had taken a long, very expensive voyage on a sailing ship. Winthrop convinced a group of British Puritans to invest in building an iron smelting plant on the banks of the Saugus River. The smoldering mass of fuel and iron ore in the blast furnace was driven to extreme temperatures by two large bellows forcing air into the base of the furnace. More than half of the smelter's output of iron was used to make slender iron strips called nail rods. Building a civilization in the wilderness required plenty of nails. Every nail was handmade. In the 130 years between the building of the Saugus Iron Smelter and the Declaration of Independence in 1776, one-seventh of all iron production on earth was from the American colonies. As the settlements grew and spread across the continent, a necessary part of every town was a blacksmith shop. But today, in the industrial age, when iron is cheap and labor is expensive, most worn or broken things are replaced rather than being repaired. But there are a few dedicated people working to preserve the art and craft of the traditional blacksmith. This show is dedicated to one such group, the Bandy Blacksmith Guild, at the Great Day History Center in Escondido, California. Good afternoon, we're at uh, Great Day Park in Escondido, and we have the pleasure of uh, visiting with uh, Philip Ewing, who's the head blacksmith here at the blacksmith shop. So we wanted to ask him uh, a little bit more about uh, the blacksmithing here. So, um, Philip, how did you start with um, wheel making and getting your start in blacksmithing? Uh, I used to work part-time at a blacksmith shop in Lakeside and um, I worked on farm machinery and wooden wheels occasionally and one time a whole truckload of wooden wheels came in from Arizona and um, New Mexico from the Indians and uh, La Madrid uh, really didn't want to work on them and I said I'd love to so I started patching those things up and they were a real mess but I learned how to how to patch up wheels. Uh -huh. Then I got to working on um, some of the vehicles that he built for the Fiesta del Pacifico, which used to be a great uh, pageant down in San Diego. I was uh, a couple of years in, in college and then got drafted, went to Europe, and spent some time in the blacksmith shops over in Germany and learned how to make uh, the German type wheels, which are very similar to ours. And then we got into um, uh, this portion of the area in Escondido. And uh, I started working here for Bandy's. And now, I've been here ever since. Wow. And so how did uh, Bandy's come to be? Have they always been here in Escondido? or? Uh, uh, the shop started in 1908 over on Calamia and Ohio. Ohio now is Valley Parkway. Uh -huh. Alright, one of the things we have here is some of the papers that I found in the old shop. <clears throat> this was a uh, bill from the Mutual Water Company here in Escondido and it's dated 10 to 09. That's about the time the shop started and it shows a whole list of uh, some of the things that they had purchased at that time. Uh, Shoes, nails, and sundries was seven dollars and twenty cents. <coughs> that probably ended up being uh, seventy-five pounds of iron. Some of the old business cards. Here's a picture of the shop, probably in the 1940s. It had great big eucalyptus trees around it at the time. 
this was uh, eventually torn down in the late 40s and they built commercial buildings in there. Here's one of the old um, bills that they would send out. <coughs> this I found was an insurance policy for old Tom Bandy. That thing was stuck in a box way back and the rats had eaten a little bit of it so I brought it out and put it in a frame. Nice. Just a little bit of history. It is. Yeah. It's kind of neat to see uh, something recorded back that old uh -huh. to do. Uh -huh. We did agricultural stuff. We did some RV. We did uh, whatever came in, basically. Uh, I like to, to do the wheels. So when the RV work kind of went out in the mid-70s with a gasoline crunch, I thought, I'm getting rid of that. I'm going into wheel work and so that's where I've been. And the shop was moved here? Um, no, this is a new building here. The city didn't want the old shop here. Oh. They said it was ugly. Oh no. So anyway we, uh, the townspeople built this this uh -huh. um, shop here. We started in in 93. Oh. Uh, set up a school through adult education mm -hmm. and uh, we had, basically we've had full classes ever since. Well now how do people find out about it? And do you take uh, anybody or? Yeah, um, we've had people come from as LA County, Riverside County, Imperial County, all through this county. Uh, it's basically word of mouth. People that are interested in blacksmithing, mm -hmm. they gravitate to us. Wow. And we do the, um, the basic blacksmithing. We, think we do, um, intermediate and advanced. We go into uh, some blade making, we go into um, ornamental iron. Uh, I particularly uh, stress tool making. The blacksmiths are tool makers, they have to make a tool for everything they do. Oh really? You, so you make a lot of the tools that you Oh use. you bet, there's certain tools you can buy. Um, so these are wheelwright tools right here. This is for pointing the end of the spoke and then putting the tendon on the end of the spoke. Oh, wow. But things like rivet sets, we just make those. Center punches, chisels, all kinds of jigs. So it sounds Stuff like that you can't buy, you make. <laughs> I guess so. Well, it sounds like there's plenty to do. And I was looking here at this... Um what what is this that you're uh, working on? In this well, this is a running gear for this uh, mud wagon body here. This is what they call a uh, mountain wagon running gear. It um, was produced probably back in the 1880s originally when, when the steel springs came out. They were uh, much more efficient than the old thoroughbrace leather. And um, will this be actually something that people will be riding in when it's finished or? Well it goes to the museum down in Rancho Bernardo. Uh, we're building oh, it here. Historical? It's going to be it's going to be down there at the winery. Oh. And they'll have it on display down there. And occasion we'll take it out. Uh -huh. I brought a picture in to, to show you we had it hooked up. But oh there it is right there. Oh that's great. So here's the picture. I don't know if you have it. Okay. Um, and why do they call it a mud wagon? Well, it's a it's an open open coach. There's no doors on it. They did have um, roll down canopies on it, so you could uh, get out of some of the weather. But mm -hmm. I assume it has got its nickname is because if you got in it during wet weather, you got muddy. You did, you did. It kind of reminds me of a, a small version of a of a uh, uh, a stagecoach in a way. So it is. So, Phil, what inspired you to take on this project? Uh, could you tell us about that? Well, we had a couple of fellows from the Bernardo Museum come up and ask about it. So before we uh, got started on this, we had to finish the project we were in. So they, they learned how to scrape paint <laughs> for a few weeks until we got it pretty well along. And then <clears throat> I had part of a running gear in my barn and um, 
And this is the... Part of, part of the running gear was part of the springs, the axles, and the fifth wheel, which is the uh, primary uh, basis of the running gear. Okay. Uh, we enlarged everything on it. We straightened the axle so we could get the um, differential in the height of the wheels more like a, a stage would be. We <coughs> cut the ends of the axles off and added new uh, boxings and roller bearings on the thing. We built the wheels. We had to take the springs. Some of the springs were missing off the original running gear. So we had to add springs to them, plus we added uh, two more leaves in each one of the sets. And that was very time consuming because everything you have to draw it out, mash it together, and make sure that you see no daylight between the springs. So it uh, took a while to do that. Once we got that pretty well together, <coughs> we had to make the brake assembly. And um, being a short coupled vehicle like this, we had to offset the the brake. Once we got that set up, then we built the brake arm and the beams. And that's the brake arm? Yes, that's your uh, your foot pedal, you might say. So the driver puts his foot down? On the top up there. Oh. You can see the peg up oh, there for you. Oh, oh my goodness. It, it starts at the, right alongside you there, you throw the thing forward and you stick your foot out and put your foot on the brake. Oh, I see. Okay. It's a little easier to explain when the body's on, but uh, yeah. right now we still got a lot of work to do on the body before we put it back on. Ordinarily that will be, uh, when it goes to the paint shop, the running gear will go in, it'll get painted one color, then we take the body in and we paint that the corresponding color. Wow. And then... <clears throat> The guys have fun doing all of the pinstriping and upholstery. And yeah. And when you're building this, I don't suppose there's any auto parts store to go anything you need. No, you just make it. You had to build yeah. it all. Yeah. Well, it looks really interesting. I'm eager yeah. to see. So many of these things you can't buy anymore, like these clips right here. Uh -huh. You have to make those. Uh, everything we've used on here has been uh, traditional square bolts with the carriage bolts and the uh, machine bolts are all old stock that I've picked up over a period of years. The, um, a few minor things that we have done on this thing that, that uh, they didn't have back in the other way, we have the adjustments on the brake up there so we can get an even push on this. Uh, brakes wear different depending on what type of uh, terrain you're in. So I added that to it. 90% of the time, nobody would ever see that because it's all underneath. Yeah. So we're lucky to see it like this. And I guess the brakes were pretty important to keep the horses from. Well, the brakes serve a, a point. You're never going to stop the horses with a brake. No? No. The brake is when you're going downhill, oh. you, you use the brake to keep the, the weight of the vehicle off the horses are going down. And uh, when you're loading and unloading, then you use the brake. So if the horses happen to move backwards or forwards, that it doesn't throw the passengers off. Yeah, that's not good. So <clears throat> this part's the easy part for me. The hard part is building this. Oh, really? This whole body we built is all mortise and tinted. Um, the flare right here, if you notice, it isn't a straight side, it has a little flare on the thing, so you can get a little more width on the uh, seats. Mm -hmm. And did you make all these? Uh, these are so interesting. And Yeah, and we made those. They're all set up so, you know, when you're climbing in here, you've got something you can get a hold of. Yeah. Well, we're anxious to see it when it's all complete. It's really quite well, a project. We have the front boot and a rear boot over there. It, uh, it's all been completed. And it's basically, we just have some detail work to do on it. We're just getting pretty close to being done. Well, great. I Except for the sanding. Oh, my. The finish work is, the, is to me, is the hardest part. Well, maybe you can get them to come back up and help you again. 
I don't do that kind of work. <laughs> oh. We have uh, the appointments on here. This is for the lamps. And of course, the whip socket. So everything is, is going to be just about the way it was when they uh, originally had these vehicles. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. The what? Oh, yes. <clears throat> we built this. This is something that uh, they wanted down there at the museum, but this canopy will be removable. Oh, really? We've got eight bolts on that thing, and the thing lifts completely off. Oh, my goodness. Um, why uh, is that so you can get it in and out? or Get it in and out of the building, yeah. yes. Oh, I see. Well, that must have been kind of interesting to figure out how to do that, even. Yeah, but it worked out fine. Yeah. It, uh, well, if you and if you notice, everything here is all riveted together. This whole body has <coughs> uh, steel inside it and then everything has been riveted. Back in the early days, rivets were used extensively. They were cheaper than nuts and bolts, and they didn't come loose. Well, you're very talented, and we, we're so glad that you're able to. Well, I got a good crew yes, here. I can tell. They were busy, busy this morning. They, when they, got they, here. they show up a couple days a week, and we, we work on it. Well, thank you for And they put up with a lot of my uh, idiosyncrasies. Oh. It's got to be this way. Well, you're the boss. So, well, we really appreciate you taking time to tell us about it, and we'll all look forward to seeing it when it's at the museum. Well, I tell you what, <clears throat> it's the crew over here that does the work. Well, thank you guys. Really, really, <laughs> really looks good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Break time. Hi, I'm at, standing outside the blacksmith shop with Wendy Barker, who's the executive director of the Escondido History Center. Hayes TV is grateful to Wendy and the people here at Great Day Park for their help in telling the story of the blacksmith's role in building America. We came to the History Center because they have a working blacksmith shop with an active training program to keep the blacksmith's art alive in an age of mass production and disposable technology. While we've been putting the show together, we saw that Great Day Park is a treasure trove of objects and information for anyone interested in the history and the people who built our modern world that we've all inherited. So in the last few minutes of our show today, I've asked Wendy to walk along the path with us along the row of historic structures and objects and tell us something about them. And who knows, we may have another Pace TV show along the way. Wendy, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the history of how uh, the blacksmith shop came to be here? I, I can, absolutely. This is uh, not quite a replica but it's a Tom Bandy's blacksmith shop. And he was um, not the first blacksmith in Escondido, but the first one who came and stayed. And uh, he had a shop a few blocks away. We would have loved to move it here like we did a number of other historic buildings, but we weren't allowed to. So this is um, a recreation. It's, it's not quite a replica because we have um, our school here, five extra forges for the school. And it's a great shop. We also at, later added on a Wheelwright shop. But one of the things that we do is not only work here, but we often go and work in other places. They just finished four volunteers from um, this group, uh, worked on the San Salvador, which is the Maritime Museum's mm -hmm. big ship that they have just built, a replica of um, Cabrillo's ship. And uh, these are a couple of the pieces that they made. They made really large things this is called a dead eye. Um, they had to get some special equipment for some of the things that they were building, but they also built things like um, a ship doctor's tools. So it was a lot of fun for them. They had um, a whole blacksmith set up down at Spanish Landing for, again, for four years and worked closely with um, the Maritime Museum to do all of that. Other things that are here on site, um, our most iconic building is this one over here. It's the Escondido's Santa Fe Depot. Well, let's um, go on down here and see what other structures that um, you've brought into this park. Okay, and so like the blacksmith shop, like I said, um, 
it's not exactly a replica, but uh, it was originally just this first part. And then uh, 2007, we added on this wagon workshop and we um, are excited to be able to work with woodworking tools as well and to build wooden wet wagon wheels. Most people have no idea how to build those, but we've got people who do. Right now, we've been working with the uh, Rancho Bernardo Historical Society and they've been building a mud wagon. And we have photographs of what it looked like and it says right on it, Escondido, San Diego. And the trip down to San Diego cost one dollar. Took almost all day. They would have a stop in Poway. So if you were going to San Diego, it was really a three-day trip because it was a day down, a day to do your business, mm -hmm. and a day back. And so we think traffic is bad now, but you know, <laughs> nothing like it used to be. I guess not. Um, and this is our, our barn. We, this moved here in 1976, which is the year our, our museum opened. And it's unusual for us in that um, the other buildings were just picked up and moved. This one was dismantled and rebuilt around a new frame by the Kiwanis Club and um, it's it's pretty cool. We've got um, several old cars in there and some farming oh, wow. equipment. It's also storage for us. And out front we have a, a tractor uh, because again this was farm country. Um, people don't realize there's still actually a lot of agriculture in Escondido but now it tends to be smaller or it's just on the hillside. But there's a lot of 10 acre or smaller little farms. Mm -hmm. And then we're coming up on the uh, our Victorian house. It was built in 1890, so that's just two years after incorporation. We have it fully furnished. It's two floors of beautiful furnishings. And uh, we have it set up to look like it's about uh, 1900, so 12 years or so after incorporation. We don't um, interpret any particular family because we, we don't know too much. It was a rental for about 30 years. Oh. But we do know that there was no running water until 1920. And in 1920, a, a new family uh, moved in. They were from the Midwest. It was a husband who was a minister, came out here for a job. His wife and five kids who came cross country in a little Model A or Model T. Oh, wow. And then they later had three more kids. So they had eight kids in that house, which is not that big. No. But it was on um, Nutmeg, which today is Escondido Boulevard. And then next to it is this tank house, and that's what they had built when they moved in. And we, we suspect that it was made by somebody in their congregation who didn't really know what they were doing. Um, all of these buildings are owned and maintained by the city, and so the porch on the house right now is being uh, rebuilt. And the tank house was rebuilt a number of years ago. It was underbuilt, the frame was too small and had termite damage. And so I told the city's carpenter at the time, you know, you have to replicate it because it's got this interesting wood detail. So finally, they're about to do it, and he thinks he's going to have to go get wood milled. So he comes and cuts off a little piece of board so he can get wood milled. And he goes, oh my god, I can buy this at the store now. It's tongue and groove siding, but this is why we think it was somebody who didn't really know what they were doing. It's on upside down and backwards. So it's just kind of a weird thing, but it, it's got that nice little line, and so they would pump water up to the tank on top, and then they would have a, a pipe that would go into the kitchen, so they would have gravity feed mm -hmm. water. So, so she didn't have to come to the well. Exactly. Pump water. Yeah. So she was really happy about that. Oh, sure. sure. And then out front here is um, one of the benches that the blacksmith made, and right here is a, a time capsule. This was buried for the bicentennial. And it's on October 8th, and that's an important day in Escondido history because that's the day our city was founded. So, and then it's going to be opened in 100 years from when it was buried, so in 2076. Well, I guess we won't get to see it. I, I don't think so. And then um, over here is a matati. This is a Native American grinding stone. Um, it's got a number of holes, a really deep one, really deep, a bunch of uh, shallower ones. But um, Native Americans would grind um, acorns or other nuts or you know all, all types of things, and that was a big part of their, their diet. And, um, smaller ones are all kind of over the city, but th this is a quite large one. And then um, this is our office. This is uh, the city's first public library. It was built in 1895, and it was a library until 1910. So it hasn't been a library for over 100 years. Um, it was. Uh, 
home, it was a doctor's office, it was a number of different things. And it was the first building that was, historic building that was moved to the park in 1971 because it was on Grand and Ivy and they were working on the road and it was, you know, not being used. So they moved it here to preserve it. It was actually the California's first uh, um, recognized bicentennial project. And it was actually city offices for a while, Parks and Rec. And then in 1976, we opened it as our museum. Today, um, it's our offices, but there's also um, a, a one big uh, changing exhibit space um, in the office that we change regularly and a lot of really great photos. So people like to come in our office as well. And it's got these fabulous railings that the blacksmiths made that I imagine you have already talked about in this program. And then uh, this rose garden here that was put in and is maintained by the History Center for over 20 years. And um, the large uh, archway and door gate, gate I should say, um, that was made by one of the very first advanced blacksmithing classes. So that was a class project. So if people wanted to come and visit the park, when's, uh, when are you open? And um, Our office is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. We encourage people to come in and, and check things out. The other buildings, um, the house, the depot, and the railroad car are open um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. Blacksmith shop has classes Saturday mornings. Um, they're usually here Saturday afternoons, but kind of depends. Summertime, not always, because it's really hot to work on a angle um, and the barn is honestly only open for special events because oh. it tends to be storage but it's a great park surrounded by lots of cultural um, amenities it was always on September 9th which is um, California admission day when California became a state we don't celebrate that anymore so um, we revived it in 1996 and now it's always the Saturday after Labor Day and it's vendors and entertainment, grape stomping and free grapes and you know all kind of, the blacksmiths are demonstrating, um, artists are demonstrating. It's just a fun, free family day. It's a, a lovely event. Something to put on our calendars Absolutely. for sure. Well I really appreciate you taking time today to tell us all about the park. I know I want to come back and visit the insides of these buildings and mark my calendar Great. for a great day. Uh, and um, Pace TV uh, uh, thanks you again and uh, hopefully many of our viewers will come and visit Grape Day Park here in Escondido. Thank you.